every time there's uh, an election that rolls around, it reminds us exactly how important it is that we have a well-formed and deeply forged Christian world and life view. And so the goal of this series is very much while we're doing establishing foundations in our small groups, which I hope you're doing, keep doing it. Uh, we're, we're getting good reports back. Um, we, while you're doing the work deep in the text of scripture in your small group, this is designed to be like glasses that you put on, that you could form a way of looking at the world that isn't merely based on what you like or your aesthetic or your uh, emotions or your experience, but rather on the word of God and how God thinks and feels about all kinds of issues. And that, if you do it, will make you feel like a stranger in America. It'll make you feel politically homeless. It'll make you seem odd, but the Bible talks about the good effect of a peculiarly Christian people, which is what I very much hope for us to be and to become today. Now, if you have a Bible, I'd love for you to go ahead and open it to the book of Genesis. Um, as you do that, just a bit of a disclaimer. Today, I'm going to be talking about some issues that you will no doubt some of you find controversial. Um, my goal is not to like be controversial uh, for its own sake, um, but rather to just be faithful. Um, I'm a pastor. I'm not a political commentator. Um, and so my job up here, just, just if you're wondering, like, how do I know if I've stuck the landing uh, on a sermon? I know I've stuck the landing if I've been faithful to the text of Holy Scripture. Um, and so my goal with this whole series is to be faithful, even if you find that faithfulness somewhat disturbing. And no doubt some of you will find it disturbing today. But my responsibility before the Lord is to teach you what the Bible teaches, to say what it says, and to impart to you the wisdom of God that is found in the scriptures as well as I possibly can do. And so today we're going to be doing that with regard to this particular topic of what it means that we are made in the image of God and how our status as imagers or image bearing creatures should affect how we think, how we act, and yeah, how you should vote. So if you are able, please stand to your feet as I read these two very brief but incredibly important passages of scripture. I will read, we will pray, and by faith, God is gonna to speak to us. Genesis 126, a super familiar passage, says this. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female. He created them. The next text is from the 10 commandments, the Decalogue as it is sometimes called, and it is the application, one of the applications of what we just read. And it is this command, you shall not murder. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Spirit, please help us today as we consider the text and how we should live. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. Some of us have bad ideas. Would you dislodge them? Lord, some of us, were, we are carried around by our emotions. Would you help us to feel the way you feel today about ourselves and the world around us? Lord, others of us come in here and we're going to need healing. So heal us. Do what only you can do through the power of your word and the presence of your spirit, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. When approaching the topic of human life and human dignity, uh, it has been reflected back to me that uh, some of you have been taught that the only reason that churches talk about things like uh, life and issues associated to life are because somewhere around the late 1960s and early 1970s, the Republican Party in the United States needed a new political uh, tool to get people to vote for it. And so it captured evangelicals by talking about a thing um, that it had never up to that point spoken about. That's an interesting theory. Um, the only problem with it is history. Because Christians have been caring about life for as long as we've been Christians. One of our earliest documents that we have after the close of the canon of the New Testament is a document called the Didache. It was written, I don't know, a couple of decades after the final book of the New Testament was completed. And it's a manual for Christian life and worship. Um, someone's collected thoughts, uh, or the early church's collected thoughts about what it means to be a Christian. And right there in it, this very brief document is instructions about how we are to treat the poor and yes, how we are to treat uh, the, the unborn and the very unwell and we are to care for them and we are not 
to harm them. Christians have cared about life for a very, very long time. In fact, it really frustrated the government of the late Roman Empire that Christians cared so much about life. So much so that um, one of the late emperors, Julian the Apostate, uh, noted it in his own writings to one of his prelates. Um, Julian was an interesting fellow. He was, I believe, the grandfather of Constantine. Um, and uh, Julian was very convinced that the problem with the Roman Empire was that it needed to abandon this Christianity stuff and go back to the good old days of pagan worship. And so Julian the Apostate was very interested in setting up worship of the pagan gods. And he was so frustrated that these Christians were such good people that he was writing to one of his prelates saying, this is terrible stuff because they're not just taking care of their own poor, but they're taking care of ours as well. They're not just caring for their own issues, but they're caring for the other issues around them, and it's making us pagans look bad. I wonder what it would be like for us to be so robustly Christian that we frustrate our government too. What caused Christians to care about this stuff and to treat other human beings so radically different than their pagan neighbors? Because they did. You have to understand that you live in a, a civilization that is so irreversibly Christianized that even our categories of thought are echoes of a Christian ethic. But not so then. At that point, no one cared about orphans. Exposing infants that you didn't want was a very common practice. If you had a girl and you were hoping for a boy, which is what happened most of the time that this practice was engaged in, you would simply take that baby girl and set it outside, somewhere far enough away that you couldn't hear that child cry. This was the practice called exposure. And so what Christians began to do is to go collect these infants and then raise them in these new things called orphanages. And they begin to advocate for the rights of the least of these. Why? Because Christians believe something very different than pagans believe. Pagans believe that humans are here by happy accident, by interesting chance, or by a cosmic duel amongst the gods. Pagans think very differently about what a human is. Christians are taught that humans are made in the image of God, that we have the status of being image bearers, regardless of our station in life or income or skin color. And therefore we must all matter very much to God. And if we matter very much to God, then we have to treat one another like we matter very much to God. They saw other humans as image bearers of almighty God because human beings are nothing less than the image of God. You and me are nothing less, whatever else we are, you cannot reduce us down to anything less than the image of almighty God. This is extremely important because if we don't believe that about each other, then the way we treat one another will certainly reflect that. Jesus, of course, taught this when he was approached by someone and said, hey, Jesus, what is the first and greatest commandment? Jesus' answer was, well, the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with everything you got and your neighbor as yourself. Why did he connect the vertical love that humans are meant to have with toward God with the horizontal love we're meant to have toward each other. Because if I say I love God, if I'm showing up to Aletheia and I'm listening to John lead us in amazing worship and the sound is amazing and my, I'm just singing and I'm going for it, but then I walk out of here and I treat you poorly, I am a liar. Your love for God is not measured in your emotionality toward him, but your obedience to him. And if I say I love God, but I hate my brother, I'm a liar. That's almost a direct quote from the book of 1 John. Jesus said that the world's going to know that we are disciples of Jesus, not by our passion, not by our emotions, not by our cool buildings or rad band, but rather by our love for one another. And so if we're going to love one another well, we have to understand that we are nothing less. You and I are nothing less than the image of God. So here's going to be our procedure today. First, we're going to ask ourselves the question, what is that? What is the image of God? What are we referring to when we talk about the image of God? And then the second part of our time together is going to be discussing how we as imagers should treat one another with regard to a few issues. So what does it mean that we are the image of God? Well, first, let me tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean your uniqueness or special specialness. 
That is not what the image of God refers to. Though you are super unique, and there are plenty of scriptures to describe you as a handcrafted masterpiece by Almighty God, the image of God in you is not reflective of your uniqueness, but of our sameness or our unity in that we are made with this status together. It should be the thing that unites us, not divides us. Weird things are happening in modern versions of Christian theology where we're sort of describing the image of God in you versus the image of God in me. It doesn't make any sense. The image of God is what makes us together, not apart. The image of God is fundamentally about God and not fundamentally about you or your personality or proclivities. This is about your status that you have of God-likeness. So what does that mean? What is this image then? The image of God is the special status that all human beings have as those made to reflect our creator's character and commissioned to carry out his purposes in the world. We're made to reflect God's character and commissioned to carry out his purposes in the world. And that, having been made that way, is a status that we have, not a thing that we do or an object that we obtain or achieve. You are this because you are human, and that's it. You don't have more of the image of God if you're really smart, or less of it if you're quite simple, more of it if you're white versus black, more of it if you're rich versus poor. That's not how it works. Every human who is a human is an image bearer of God Almighty. And you have to let that really sit in your soul or some really weird and terrible ethical things will come out of your mind and mouth. One theologian puts it this way, what makes humans the image of God is not that corporeal man stands as an analogy to a corporeal God, that is, we don't look like an embodied God somewhere in the clouds. The image of God doesn't primarily mean similarity, but the representation of the one who is imaged in a place where he's not. According to Genesis 1.26, which is what we just read, God set humans on earth in order to be the representative of God there, of a God who is absent in a way that we are present. So it's a status. All of us have it, regardless of capacity, belief, emotionality, action, ethnicity, background, economy. You bear God's image because you are human. And all humans, regardless of their feeling about it or what they have done or have yet to do, are themselves images of God. Now, In the history of Christian theology, people have sought to try and locate the image of God in some different places. Someone said first, early on in the history of theology, oh, maybe it's the image of God is in our rationality, like our rational ability to like think through a problem. That's a God-like power. And while it is a God-like power, if we locate the image of God in our rationality, then people who aren't rational aren't image bearers. So that would mean the very, very young, the very, very old, and all teenagers. We can't locate the image of God in a, in a thing that you have or lack. So someone came along and they said, well, perhaps, perhaps the image of God is more to be found in our capacity for relationships, right? So humans were made to know God, and so I presumably can know God in a way far better and different than, say, a daffodil or a dolphin. So I bear the image of God in a way that those things do not. Well, that is true. You do bear the image of God and a daffodil and a dolphin do not bear the image of God. It can't be simply located in your relatability because there are certain people who lack the capacity to have human relationships by virtue of some lack of capacity in their own physiology. Are we to say that they don't bear the image of God? Certainly not. In fact, the Bible says something quite the opposite of that, that all human beings are literally knit together in their mother's womb and that God has a plan for all human beings such that he's written all the days ordained for all human beings in his book before one of them even comes to pass. He's had an infinite number of thoughts about you and we get this artistic picture of God creating humans right there at the very beginning of the Bible. God sticks his hand in the clay and forms like a little model, a piece of art, a sculpture the first human, and he breathes into this first human the very breath of life. So yeah, we do have capacities, but our God-likeness, the image of God, doesn't dwell in our capacities. It dwells in us because it is us. This is a bit like saying you don't have a body, you are your body. You don't have a soul, you are your soul. 
You don't have the image of God. It is what you are by virtue of being human. If that's true, and it is very much true, then that means we have certain moral duties toward the image in other people. And we are ethically bound by God to treat the image of God in each other well. Because if we don't, then it says something about the way we think about God. Does that make sense? So, how should we live? Well, there are certain things that we as Christians, particularly in our political lives, have to oppose. And then a whole other set of things that we absolutely have to celebrate and affirm. So let's think about what some of those things Christians must oppose. Because we're not merely in the image of God, but we are imaging, that is our vocation, our literal calling, there are things that we have to be the ones to go, hey, that's not okay. That's not on. One of the first things that shows up in the history of the Christian church is opposition to abortion. Christians are against abortion, very simply, because babies bear God's image. That's it. And before you fill your mind with, ah, yes, but what about all of these? Just hold on there. Before you look for the exceptions, just think about the rule for a moment. All humans, be they quite young or near death, bear the image of God. And the geography of a human doesn't change that. We're not less human because we're inside of a building than we are outside of the building. And children aren't less human because they're located inside of their mother's womb. Abortion, therefore, is the destruction of the image of God in the place where it's meant to be the safest, in the womb of a mother. Now, I've heard it said, and I've heard it said after one of these services, which, uh, abortion is not something that we should be talking about in the church because there are so many other problems. And I totally agree. There are many, many, many problems. But according to the Guttmacher Institute, 73 million human beings were destroyed by abortion last year. Do you know how many humans died last year by every other cause combined? 61 million. So think about that. All wars, all poverty, all disease, all everything, all of that added up in the year 2023, 61 million human deaths. That's 12 million fewer than the amount of people killed by abortion. That's a lot. Not only that, but abortion is the leading cause of death amongst people of color. Last year, 59% of all abortions in the United States were performed upon women of color, which I find heartbreaking, which mixes this affront to the image of God with a form of racism, which is also an affront to the image of God that we will get to shortly. Yet, this is precisely what the founder of the largest abortion provider in the world wanted. Planned Parenthood was founded by a woman named Margaret Sanger. She was a eugenicist who hated non-white people. She was very out front about it, though. You don't have to dig very far, and I encourage you on your way out today to Google this woman because she very much wanted her clinics to destroy non-white lives. In fact, in a letter that's been uh, now publicized, of course, that she wrote to one of her collaborators as all of this was coming into being, she wrote this, we do not want word to get out that we want to exterminate the N-word population. So the minister of that population is the man who can straighten out the idea if it ever occurs to any of the more religious members of that group. I feel gross even reading that quote to you. In 1921, this same woman wrote an article in the Birth Control Review that birth control and abortion, and I'm quoting here, must ultimately lead to a cleaner race. That is moral evil. Now, as Christians, we, again, believe all human beings are nothing less than the image of God. So, if we advocate for these things as a Christian, it's almost always because our empathy for those in a very difficult situation in which they find themselves pregnant but did not wish or plan to be, that empathy is being allowed to control your wisdom and judgment. Empathy is not a virtue. It's a way of knowing things. 
And sometimes it can be weaponized against those who have it to make very unwise decisions and say very unwise things. While there are some incredibly tragic circumstances that lead some people to think that this is the only way to make life better, the destruction of innocent life is never the right way to put our lives back together when they feel out of control. So let me say a few things pastorally. If you've had an abortion and you're here, I love you, I'm not mad at you. And I'm very, 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 very glad that you're here. I am not here to judge you or heap any kind of condemnation on you because that would be incredibly hypocritical of me. I'm a sinner in great need of grace, just like everyone else. You know, God has mercy for all of us, no matter what we have done, if we would ask him. If you find yourself facing an unplanned pregnancy and you don't know what to do, God brought you here today because we have resources, we want to help you. And we partner with organizations who want to help you. And we very much want to walk alongside you through whatever life throws at you. That's what it means to be the church. Being the church doesn't mean showing up to 85 Bishop Allen Drive and sitting in some gray chairs that all face the same direction and then doing whatever we want for the rest of the week. I'm very glad that you're here, but it means being a spiritual family toward one another. And we don't destroy inconvenient parts of our family. If that's you and you're like, I don't quite know what to do, we have a Bible study we'd love to let you know about um, and a group of people who would love to come alongside you and help care for you. Um, We have some amazing partners in the city who would love to help you with that. But abortion is one of those things that we must stand against precisely because human beings are nothing less than the image of God. We must also stand against some more new ways of affronting the image of God. Another one, would be euthanasia. The word euthanasia is, of course, one of the most Orwellian terms ever. It literally means a good death. But we do not believe that destroying the elderly or the infirm because they are old and infirm is a good thing. We are not to be for the destruction of human life simply because it becomes inconvenient and expensive to care for. Christians are to suffer with dignity and to serve the suffering with faithfulness. Often this issue comes shrouded again in the cloak of compassion to weaponize your empathy against you to make you make foolish and ungodly choices. But really, really, euthanasia comes from a desire for great amounts of social selfishness. Most medical costs are incurred in the last stages of life. That's true in all developed countries. And so one way to make the books balance is to simply skip that part for people. Now, maybe you think, oh, no one's doing that. Yes, they are. Our neighbors to the north are. In 2016, Canada passed the Medical Assistance in Dying Act, or what's called MAID. It came with all of the familiar sounding arguments. This gives you bodily autonomy, a death with dignity and self-determination. The only problem with that is that Christians are not to seek autonomy. The Bible tells me that my life is not my own any longer. I was bought with a price. Now, it was originally open to people who were just suffering near the ends of their lives. And, you know, of course, we don't want people to suffer. But now, and very quickly after it was started, has been expanded to the young who are just mentally unwell. The marginalized, the poor, the drug addicted, and the homeless. In fact, those same groups of people now report in a uh, recently reported study to the Canadian government that they feel great social pressure to choose to die through MAID because it's being told to them as their best option. Now, this way of death represents almost 6% of all deaths in Canada since its founding, and it's rising every year. The late Pope John Paul II says, by euthanasia, the direct killing of another human being, we violate the image of God in that person. Human life is sacred because it bears the imprint of God's creative act, and to take this into our human hands is a grave violation of this dignity. Human beings are nothing less than the image of God. And we cannot therefore snuff them out at the early and late stages of development because of inconvenience or fear. The third thing Christians must stand against because human beings are nothing less than the image of God is racism. Usually everyone goes, oh God, okay, yeah. that makes more sense. You live in a very blue state. And blue states tend to be really into those first two things. I'm not saying that politically. I mean, that's just a fact of our current political moment. 
we have to decide if we're going to be okay being strangers in a very blue state. And I'm not saying that we do that by becoming a red state. That, no, no, no. But by becoming more Christ-like. Racism is wrong for the same reason. All humans bear the image of God. Human beings bear the image of God regardless of their skin color or ethnicity or language. And the mistreatment of other people based on innate characteristics like skin color, accent, ethnic background, all come under the rubric of racism, and that is wrong. John Perkins, the late Christian social activist, wrote this, racism is an affront to the dignity of all human beings because it is a rejection of the biblical truth that every person is created in the image of God. Another pastor, Tony Evans, says racism isn't a bad idea. It's not a mistake. It's sin. The answer to racism, therefore, is not sociological. It is theological. The image of God gives every person dignity and worth. So racism is a theological crime against God himself. I wholeheartedly agree. Hating someone or mistreating them on the basis of their skin color or background is wrong because there is no skin color that's smudges the image of God in anyone else. Has the church gotten this right all of the time? No. And that is a sad fact of our history. That sad fact of our history has caused some to embrace a terrible idea to try and fix the problem of racism, sometimes coming under the guise of anti-racism. Just across the river, works a gentleman who wrote this in one of his New York Times best-selling books. The only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. And the only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. Now, while we should have a deeply shared desire to see racial justice and reconciliation happen, one can never arrive at reconciliation by taking the root of more discrimination. The problem with this view and the problem with this path is that it will never ever work and only ever make the problem much, much worse. Why? Because it doesn't respect the image of God in another person. For the same reason, the racist is wrong, so is this man. It lacks a clear understanding of human nature, a clear understanding of the root problem behind discrimination. It ignores the biblical emphasis on grace. And moreover, it is certainly a good thing that Jesus does not treat us with that ethic. It is good that Jesus does not say to human sinners, the only way to ameliorate your past sin is for me to sin against you. No, this is just a very highfalutin, postmodern way of achieving recompense perhaps, but certainly not reconciliation. While we can understand in the desire to pursue this path, it won't work. Christian scholars, almost universally, criticize this approach because from a Christian perspective, reconciliation involves grace and mercy, emphasizing that the end does not justify the means. Christian teachings advocate for justice based on love and equality, not through additional acts of exclusion or discrimination. The answer to sin is never more sin. The answer to wrongs is never more wrongs. The answer to ignoring the image of God is never to keep ignoring the image of God. Now, those are just three low controversy items Christians must oppose. Because we believe that human beings are nothing less than the image of God, what must we advocate? <laughs> so many things. Beauty and human flourishing. Christians are the most pro-human people ever, supposedly, because God's the most pro-human person ever. He made us. This whole thing, it was his idea. And when he made humans, he declared over humans that we are, and we were, very good. This idea is not something that God has given up on, and therefore not an idea that we must give up on. Some, but not all, of what this looks like is that we advocate for the protection of all human life. Like all of it. This goes from advocating for good, righteous jurisprudence to caring for the unborn and the very elderly. One of the ways that we do that around here is through a partnership with the Boston Center for Pregnancy Choices. This involves the celebration and the protection of children. We should love kids. Listen, if you're married, have kids. If you're like, I don't know if I want kids. No, no, no. No one asked you that. 
Because children are not a lifestyle choice. Dogs, those are lifestyle choices. But our current culture treats their dogs better than we treat our kids. How many times have you walked by someone making their toddler walk but pushing their dog in a stroller? If you own a dog stroller, I'm not judging you necessarily. Just all of your choices. <laughs> For us as a church, it looks like partnering with the Orphan Network. We literally feed, clothe, house, and teach the Bible to and provide medical care for some four or 500 orphans in Nicaragua every year through one of our big gift partnerships. It means that we as a church are one of the largest partners that the Department for Children and Family Services has in the state of Massachusetts. I'm so proud of you. I can't brag on, for, on me for this. Uh, this is all you guys, particularly the work of Sarah McCarthy and her team. I was recently at a festival and DCF had a booth up and I just went to talk to them and when they found out who I was and what church I represent, they said, oh my gosh, we love you guys. You are famous to us. Do you hear that? The Department of Children and Families loves your church because you guys are fostering kids. And those of you who aren't fostering them are coming around those families that do. We do that not to gain favor with the world. I don't care what the world thinks. We do that because God created humans in his image and they matter. Even the ones who feel like they don't matter. The Bible says that if you cause a child to stumble, it would be better for you to drown. You say, well, maybe that's Old Testament. Nope, that's the red letters of Jesus. That's, that's nice, gentle Jesus. He says, if you cause a child to stumble, it would be better for you that you tie a millstone. I don't know if you've ever seen a millstone, but they're huge, multi-ton stones. Tie a millstone around your neck and throw it into the sea. Why did Jesus say that? Because children are both innocent and deeply vulnerable. You wanna know what you really think about God? You can really see it in how you think about the innocent and vulnerable. The way you should vote, you know that like, you're choosing between a bunch of really fallen human beings, right? From your school committee, to your mayor, state, local, national, presidential, all of it. None of them are Jesus. I don't know if you noticed that. So you've got to pick the platform that's least likely to bring more hell. That's it. That's what you have to do. You have to pick the platform that when you, when you read the policies that are going to happen, because I don't really care, it doesn't really matter how you and I feel about these people. It matters what they do. And if what they do makes this place look more hellish and you advocate for that, you're going to have to answer for that vote. Is it Adam going to tell us how to vote? I'm literally doing it right now. I'm not telling you which candidate to vote for. I'm telling you how to think about it. If you find a political party that's for the destruction and abuse of children or a political candidate who is, that might not be for you. We are also for the honoring and caring for the old and infirm. There's a woman, she's not here today, but she usually sits right here. Her name is Miss Chris. You say, what's her full name? Doesn't matter, because you're gonna call her Miss Chris. Do you know why? Because she's, I think, 79, is that right? 79? She's been in our church for 12 years. She came to our very last preview service before we ever opened the doors, and all she's done for 14 years is pray for all of you. Because she was here for decades before any of us were praying for a church like this. I think almost every good thing we have is as a direct result of that woman's prayers. So when you walk by her, you may not call her Chris. You will call her Miss Chris, and you will say yes ma'am and no ma'am to her. Do you know why? Because the Bible says we should honor our elders. And you should honor women and men like that. I could pick on more, but I know she'll listen to this later. We care for the old. We care for those of less capacity as we define capacity. And we work really hard to have a church that's increasingly better at racial reconciliation. Are we perfect at it? No. But we are trying. And in the United States, that means that we advocate for policies that bring about not just so-called justice, but biblical justice. 
This is why we actively pursue this work as a church, and we have for a really long time. All of these things have to affect how you think about your vote. It can't just be, well, I don't like him or her. Can I tell you a secret? I don't like any of them. It just doesn't matter. All humans are made in the image of God. And we have to treat one another that way. Even and especially when it becomes really, really difficult. Do you know why we have to treat each other that way? Even and especially when it becomes increasingly difficult? Because that's how God treated me. I feel like our building's about to take off. Okay. We have an air conditioning system in this building that makes noise, but not the room cooler. It's very exciting. Well, at least it sounds like it's working. The way God has treated us is by becoming like us. Taking on the status, not just of God of the image, but the image of God himself. That's why Colossians 1.15 says that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. It doesn't mean he was born first because he's an uncreated being, but rather he has the status of firstborn. He inherits all things. For, verse 16, by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he, Jesus, is the head of the Body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether in heaven or on earth, making peace by the blood of his cross. Jesus, the image of the invisible God, took on the status of imager for those of us who made in God's image have destroyed and defaced the image of God both in ourselves and in others. Not that he might destroy us and utterly wipe us from existence, but rather that he might redeem us and restore to us the capacity that he made us with to bear his image. He took himself and the image of God upon the cross he assumed our whole nature, womb to tomb, that he might represent us fully and redeem us totally. The great preacher of the Orthodox Church, Gregory of Nazianzus, said this, For that which Christ has not assumed, he has not healed. But that which is united to his Godhead will be saved. If only part of Adam's race fell, then that which Christ assumes and saves might only be in part. But if the total nature fell, it must be totally united to the total nature of Christ that was begotten so that it might be saved totally. If we trust in him, if we come to him, we regain our status as imagers. That which smudges and crushes the image gets forgiven and removed from us so that we might be effective and faithful ministers of the gospel. This is our task, no matter who wins in a few weeks. This is our task six months after that and six days after the next election and the next election and the next election until the ruler of heaven and earth returns, not until our favorite candidate is elected. How I would love to be the rock in the shoe of a modern-day Julian the Apostate. Wouldn't it be grand if the way our government looked upon us Christians is, oh, they're so frustrating. Why? Because they're so good. They're so helpful. They're so kind and generous. I hate those guys. <laughs> uh, that's the way I want to frustrate pagans. I don't know about you. Julian noticed. What might the history books say about us? About you? What does this mean? Well, for those of you who are Christians, perhaps it means a change of mind and heart. Maybe some of what I said you disagree with, okay? If you disagree with it, it better be because you've got a better reading of Scripture. Because who cares what I think? It matters what God thinks. But if you're like, well, I don't feel like that's true. Okay. I hope you'll take your feelings and submit them to the scriptures. That seems hard. I agree. It does seem hard. But God has given us power by his spirit. Perhaps for some of you, it means today you just need to change your mind or open it 
to the formation of a deeper and more profound biblical worldview. Others of you, it means a change of action. For others of you, it means receiving grace and mercy. I'm not mad at you. Hope you know that. This is not what I sound like when I'm mad. You can ask David and Tyler. They've heard it. <laughs> yeah, give, give them a quick amen so they know. Uh, yeah, 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 right, yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love you and want to see Christ formed in you. Jesus loves you and wants to see his image revealed in you. If that means mercy, come get mercy. If that means a change of mind, come change your mind. If that means change of action, come repent. Nothing to be embarrassed about. It's what we all must do. No one gets transformed from one degree of glory to another without repenting of one, from one degree of sin to an, from another. If you belong to King Jesus, come to these tables of communion where you were reminded of what Christ's body experienced for you. His death, his blood was shed so that you and your life might be saved. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, the invitation isn't to agree with me. It's to receive Jesus. The Bible says, seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be added unto you. If we sort Jesus out and you get your perspective on Jesus sorted out, he'll handle the rest. So today, as you respond, my invitation is for you to come and receive prayer, to receive Christ, to receive grace, and to receive mercy. Will you stand and pray with me? God, we very much want to be the kind of people who think and act and sound like you. Help us. Lord, I've failed at that so many times, and I know we all have. Have mercy on us. And help us to receive that mercy and get up and do better. In Jesus' name, amen.